Um, it's a pleasure to introduce Professor Taik Chipha, who comes to us from Johns Hopkins today. He's been at University of Urbana-Champaign for 15 years, from 2000 to 2015. Before that, he was at uh, Berkeley, where he did his PhD uh, with the leaders, uh, with leaders in, um, in the field of bringing physics to biology, uh, working with uh, Raymond Jean Loz, Stephen Chu, Shimon Weiss, etc. Um, and before that, he was at Seoul National University, uh, where he did his undergraduate degree in physics. So he's a physicist, a bona fide physicist, who's come over to biology and has brought with him a variety of um, concepts, approaches um, from physics to biology, and now has been able to address some of those mysterious things like helicases and other enzymes that act on genomes, complexes that function within cells, building ever more sophisticated tools to actually look at functioning molecules in the milieu within which they function. Uh, for doing this, pioneering this frontier along the way, he has won every possible award that you can imagine, um, starting from Searle Scholars, Sloan, early days, to the Ho Am Prize, which is considered the equivalent of an early Nobel Prize that is given to Korean American scientists, um, to this year he was elected to the National Academy of Sciences. Um, we noticed his work early when he started talking about DNA structures and their plasticity, right from the days of early papers, about 200 papers ago, 197th paper, um, <laughs> that talked about, um, with Stephen Chu, by the way, who's the energy secretary also, has done enormous amount of work in single molecule studies, bringing physics against to biology. So how DNA bends, we had studied in school that DNA has a persistence length of about 500 nanometers. And here was someone who's claiming that DNA is far more plastic than that, far more mobile, far more move changeable than that. And since then, we've been following his work in every paper uh, this year, I believe he's had three or four papers in science, cell, etc. already. Um, and I'm looking forward to his stories today. And hopefully he'll continue and collaborate with small molecules that we've been developing in the lab. With that, let me not um, continue any further and hand over the stage to uh, TJ Ha, as he likes to be called. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction and invitation. That, uh, does it work? So uh, uh, I'm, I'm between jobs, uh, so it's nice to uh, be invited to get some free food and housing. <laughs> I'm a physicist by training, uh, but I forgot most of my physics and have, haven't learned enough biology to call myself a biologist. So. Uh, uh, to paraphrase a Britney Spears who sang, uh, I'm not a girl, not yet a woman. Uh, I'm not a uh, physicist, but not yet a biologist. So it's really fun to be here. Uh, lovely, beautiful campus and wonderful colleagues and students. I learned a lot. Uh, thank you very much. Many years ago, uh, Watson and Crick published this paper proposing the structure of double helix. The paper ended with a paragraph saying that, well, uh, it has not escaped our notice that the specific pairing suggests a possible copying mechanism for genetic material transfer. And they actually uh, worried that this was not uh, explicit enough uh, and that maybe someone else may take the credit for the discovery by making the claim more explicitly. So uh, a month later, they published another paper uh, proposing this base pairing, uh, and then the rest became history. That paper ended with paragraph, you know, a lot to be learned, even if this is correct. For example, what makes the pair of chains unwind and separate when DNA forms a stable double helix? It took more than 20 years until people discovered a class of enzymes called helicases. Helicases for DNA molecules uh, are DNA unwinding enzymes or unzipping proteins 
They can be also considered uh, as uh, motor proteins because they use ATP energy to power themselves on the DNA track. In fact, if you give them a single-strand DNA, they will move on the single-strand DNA in a directional manner, uh, 3 to 5 prime or 5 to 3 prime of the DNA. So you can call it a translocase. They function in many different uh, processes uh, inside a cell. Uh, they function in essentially every possible imaginable DNA, RNA metabolic processes. Um, they, uh, they unwind DNA or RNA. They can remove proteins bound to nucleic acids. They can cause branch migration of Hardy junction. They can do chromatin remodeling, RNA protein complex remodeling, and so on. And when they are not well, uh, if you have mutation in some of these enzymes, uh, you can get uh, serious human uh, genetic diseases. Some helicases form a ring uh, uh, of hexamers, and others uh, are non-hexameric. There's some dis discussion whether it's they function as a monomer or dimer that I touch upon today. Uh, you know, there are DNA helicases and RNA helicases. And some are 5 to 3 prime helicases, meaning that if you want to see unwinding of a DNA, you need to present the enzyme with uh, a DNA with a 5 prime tail so that it can bind to the tail first and then translocate in the 5 to 3 prime direction to unwind the DNA, and vice versa for 3, three to 5 prime uh, helicase. Some people are uh, so uh, in, in, you know, you know, in love with uh, these enzymes, so they pay uh, additional money to the state to uh, have a uh, license plate like this, it unwind. Uh, uh, so you can actually, uh, if you're not interested in the topic, you can just sit and unwind uh, you know, for the rest of the day here. So this is actually uh, from Missouri, my uh, longtime collaborator, Tim Luhmann, who has received his PhD in uh, biochemistry here uh, with Tom Record. Uh, I am not, I'm, I'm too cheap for doing this. Uh. <laughs> so, you know, interesting questions are, you know, how do they function and, and how are their functions uh, regulated? And and for example, you know, if you uh, of a, a switch, you know, how do you uh, turn on and off the helicase functions uh, when you need them and when you don't need them anymore? Because if these enzymes float around inside a cell and unwind every DNA, RNA they see, it can be disastrous. You need to uh, tightly regulate their functions. And how do you achieve this? Okay, this is an important number because uh, we do uh, one molecule experiment, a single molecule experiment. So uh, the main tool that we've been using is called a single molecule FRED, where if you want to measure conformational changes of an enzyme, you put green and red dye molecules on the known site so that you can distinguish between closed and open conformations. Uh, in the closed conformation, when you excite the green molecule using your laser, energy is transferred to the red, and you get uh, red photons instead of green. In the open conformation, you get uh, green photons instead. If you want to measure how quickly the butterfly flaps its wings in ensemble, you must synchronize a reaction by uh, convincing them uh, to start from one uh, conformation, one uh, sitting on the leaf, and then you can frighten them into taking off the leaf and perform relaxation measurements. But as you can imagine, in many cases, what you measure is not the wing flapping frequency, but how long it takes for the butterflies to take off the leaf. Ideally, uh, you want to measure this in, in real time, looking at a single enzyme as a function of time, and measure the anticorrelated changes in red and green intensities so that you can deduce the flap, flapping frequency of the wings and also amplitude of the motion. This can be done in actually uh, in many, many different labs in the world uh, these days and uh, uh, can be used for uh, studying you know, an uh, amazing variety of different uh, uh, systems. You can also measure uh, uh, intermolecular uh, changes using a single molecule thread. For example, if you have a helicase moving on a single-send DNA from 3 to 5 prime end, 
putting a green dye on the protein and the red dye on the destination end of the DNA, you can imagine seeing uh, as a function of time, greens it is going down and red is going up due to uh, increase in uh, FRAG. This is not uh, actual data. Uh, it's a PowerPoint animation that I made. But uh, our data is actually almost as pretty. So this is the actual data. So uh, as a function of time, you see uh, red signal is going up, green is going down. And, uh, and, uh, and the surprise here was that once it goes to the end of the track, it somehow goes back to the beginning and repeats the process many, many times. And um, I think I may even have a, OK. So anyways, we did a lot of experiments of this kind uh, to uh, get at the physical mechanism of this process and also what it might mean biologically. So we wrote up a manuscript, and uh, we were able to convince uh, some people that they, sh they can publish this paper in, uh, uh, several years ago. And then uh, I, uh, I, I paid a lot of money to a local artist in Urbana-Champaign to draw a, a, a cover illustration. This is one example where this old man is sitting on the DNA and then reeling in the DNA uh, rope and then kicking up uh, uh, proteins bound to the DNA. And uh, uh, unfortunately, they didn't take it. And instead, they uh, uh, picked uh, a picture of a uh, diabetic mouse. So it was very disappointing. Uh, it's OK. You know, sometimes you win, uh, sometimes you lose. Uh, here's another picture that they didn't take. Uh, so my student, Jia Park, uh, is uh, sitting on the DNA. And then uh, uh, she is the one who did the work and then reeling in the DNA and then kicking off the asteroids bound to the DNA. So I, I spent so much money on these cartoons, uh, I'm ha I have to show them somewhere. So that's why. <laughs> uh, another very popular single molecule method is called optical tweezers. And uh, it's basically chopsticks are made of light. So if you uh, shine uh, infrared laser in a tiny, uh, tightly focused spot, then uh, a small particle can be sucked into the middle of the spot. And then if you move the laser beam around, you can manipulate the position of the bead. If uh, DNA is attached to the bead, and then uh, there's an enzyme sitting on, on the surface pulling on the DNA, you can play a tug of war. And you, you can apply very tiny forces, about uh, a temp, uh, piconewton level of forces, and then uh, measure the response uh, mechanically uh, using forces, and also by measuring the DNA length as a function of time, it can go down to a single base pair resolution, as uh, Stephen Block has shown. The idea of using uh, stretching uh, to extract information is not new. And this is an old idea. Uh, that, uh, in, in, in medieval times, people are stretching other people to extract information and you know, asking questions such as, what is the stretch <laughs> So uh, because my lab was doing just fluorescence measurements for many, many years, I was really envious of people doing optical tweezers and getting this wonderful data. And I have, I'm a man of many envy, so I had this first envy. And this, I wanted to combine uh, the you know, uh, optical tweezers with uh, single molecule fluorescence. And the idea is to measure conformational changes using fluorescence or FRED, but as a function of applied force. And actually, there, there have been many other attempts in this direction. And li some are listed here. So I'm just telling you about our own uh, version of uh, this direction. So if you think about the optical tweezers, you are performing mechanical measurements, but with your eyes closed, like that. Right? But if you do purely fluorescence measurement, you have your ar arms tied in the back, but looking at uh, the process with your eyes passively. And the idea here is that by combining the two, you can uh, sample the best of uh, both worlds. So uh, Michelle Wang was kind enough to host my former postdoc, Sang Chol Hong, uh, uh, for a week. So he spent uh, a week in Cornell University, I think more than 10 years ago, to learn about optical tweezers. And then he came back and built an instrument combining single molecule thread and optical trap. And he was able to show that you can measure 
uh, DNA junctions dynamics using fluorescence, but as a function of force. Now he's on the faculty of Seoul National University. Uh, and I, another student then continued uh, uh, on the same instrument, uh, Rubo Zhou, who is now a postdoc with Xiao Zhang at Harvard. What he did was to uh, work with Tim Luhmann's group to, uh, to pull on the single-stranded DNA wrapped around a protein called SSB. And then uh, when you begin with uh, this state of a fully wrapped DNA, where two dyes are close to each other, you get a high threat, mainly red signal. And then uh, as you increase the force, uh, you will gradually peel the DNA off uh, the protein surface, giving rise to gradual decrease in threat that you can measure as a function of uh, increase in force. So this is the actual uh, data that he acquired. So as a function of force, you can increase the force, uh, shown in gray, uh, from low to high value gradually. You can uh, return to uh, the low value and then repeat it five times. And these are the raw data uh, of red and green intensities uh, uh, of the DNA dye. And uh, they are changing in an anticorrelate manner. And the blue is the threat efficiency that is uh, dropping gradually as you increase the force, really showing that DNA is getting peeled off gradually, little by little, as you increase the force, uh, showing that we can do these kind of measurements and so on. Actually, data was so beautiful that when my students showed me the data for the first time, I almost cried. Well, I didn't. Uh, instead, I told them, go back and take some more data, uh, that, uh, <laughs> as every good advisor should do. Right? <laughs> and then uh, we became more ambitious. So Jan Shemna is a, colleague, a former colleague in Urbana-Champagne. And so he came from Carlos Bustamante's lab. So he's an expert in uh, high-resolution optical tweezers. So uh, we combined uh, together uh, single molecule fluorescence uh, and optical tweezers of dual laser traps, you can actually have much higher uh, resolution and sensitivity. And, and here the idea is that if you uh, uh, trap two beads and then you can shine uh, a protein in the middle of the DNA, you can measure fluorescence from that protein, but uh, at the same time measuring the mechanical response uh, with, uh, down to single base pair resolution using optical tweezers. Here we had to uh, go back and forth between different lasers because if you have the trapping laser on at the same time as a fluorescence laser excitation, then uh, you get 10 times faster photo bleaching. So we had to actually do this like 60,000 uh, 60, times a second to, to avoid that issue. So it's actually a pretty uh, complicated instrument that, uh, that Matt Comstock built. Matt is now uh, uh, a physics professor in Michigan State University. So I'll show you some data that he acquired using this instrument later. Okay, so coming back to the Healy cases, how does uh, uh, you know, a motor uh, move on the track processively? Uh, one uh, possibility is to use the intro mechanism. Do you have two units of a motor protein, two different colors? And then uh, in the first step, you uh, expand the intro arm. Uh, but in the process, if you weaken the binding, uh, uh, if you have weak binding to the front, then upon expansion, the front head will go uh, forward. But uh, next time, uh, you compress the intron, but if you modulate the binding affinity so that now the front head is bound strongly, then uh, upon compression, the rear head will move uh, forward. And you can uh, repeat this process multiple times uh, to move uh, in, in, in the track linearly. And uh, for non-hexameric helicases, uh, Dale Wigley's lab really, uh, has shown really good data uh, uh, using structural biology that this is how the helicases can move on a single cell DNA track, one uh, base at a time. So here's an example of a uh, uh, helicase from uh, hepatitis C virus, uh, NS3. And, and this uh, mechanism requires two uh, non-equivalent subunits. And these are provided by um, uh, red K4s, as you uh, are f uh, familiar, uh, based uh, due to my, uh, Mike uh, Cox's uh, work on red K. So you have two like red K-like domains uh, here, and the ATP binds in between. And the ATP binding uh, then uh, causes the two domains to approach each other, compression and way the ATP dissociate, uh, interim expands. And this can repeat many, many times. So here's a structure of the uh, 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 hep C helicase bound to a piece of DNA. 
And if you look at the structure of uh, the protein uh, without any ATP, then uh, highly conserved uh, strionine residue is shown here in blue uh, in contact with the phosphate uh, backbone uh, uh, of the DNA, three nucleotides apart in this um, conformation. But if you look at a similar helicase bound uh, to an RNA in the presence of ATP analog, then uh, there's compression, intium compresses, and then there's two strain residues now, two nucleotides apart. So that gives the basis for one nucleotide uh, movement along the DNA per ATP hydrolysis. So here's an animation that uh, you know, illustrates how this could happen. So it, two Reiki-like domains here and here can move on the DNA back one, one uh, base at a time uh, per uh, ATP hydrolysis. But then how do you couple that translocation into a DNA unwinding? One possibility is the following. You unwind one base pair every time you translocate on the DNA backbone by one nucleotide. That'll be number of base pairs on one versus number of nucleotides translocate one at a time. And this was proposed by uh, structural biologists, you know, this example, for example, by uh, Ray Young's group, where they solved the structures of a UVLD helicase in many different forms. And then they were able to show that the, there is a one base pair unwinding uh, for each cycle of ATP hydrolysis. So this model will say that you have continuous process of one at a time indefinitely until the enzyme falls off the DNA. But uh, we have some interesting single molecule data that uh, we actually use to pr pr propose that for at least for NS3 helicase that uh, uh, unwinding is not happening every time you translocate one nucleotide. We propose that you wait until uh, three uh, nucleotides have, have been translocated and then you unwind three base pairs all of a sudden. And it, it continues uh, this way, more like a spring-loaded uh, mechanism. So in this animation, uh, what we are trying to depict is the idea that uh, as the uh, helicase domains move on the DNA backbone, the third domain stays behind uh, due to uh, phenylalanine residue stacking against the DNA N residue. Uh, and then after three base pairs of translocation, you unwind three base pairs uh, in a burst. Another uh, uh, data of similar kind was actually was obtained by my former postdoc, uh, Kwang Lok Lee. And in this case, we are looking at uh, what's called RIP44. It's an extra ribonuclease that um, chops the uh, RNA uh, from the end one nucleotide at a time. But you can also digest RNA that has a secondary structure duplex portion without using any ATP. So it uses the uh, hydraulic e uh, uh, energy here to, uh, to cut uh, the RNA one at a time. And we also found that in this case, uh, unwinding of the duplex uh, does not happen one base pair at a time. Although we know that motion itself is propelled one nucleotide at a time. And we, we estimated that it's about four base pairs unwound every uh, after four steps of one nucleotide, nucleotide digestion step. So that you can essentially compress the protein uh, with four steps and then it, it can uh, snap open multiple base pairs uh, at a time. And the idea of this type has been actually proposed for other systems too. For RNA polymerase initiation, uh, there is a mechanism called uh, uh, scrunching, where you can build up energy in the system until you make the transition from uh, initiation to elongation phase and escape the promoter. And uh, uh, 529 DNA packaging motors have been shown to have multi multiple layers of actually a stepping, not just single side step uh, that ha repeats indefinitely. So, uh, so that was my introduction okay, uh, to, uh, for, for the main part of the talk. So we are studying superfamily one helicases uh, named REP, UVLD, and PCRA. Uh, they function uh, in replication restart, mismatch repair, and base excision repair. And PCRA uh, actually uh, functions in phase re replication. But they're all uh, bacterial origin. They are all uh, three to five prime DNA helicases. Again, they require three prime tail for unwinding to be seen in vitro. 
And they are actually very similar in terms of structures. And in fact, I have a structure here, but I don't even remember which one it is because it doesn't actually matter because they're all very similar. There are two major conformations uh, that differ in, uh, in the rotation of this domain, uh, colors differently here around the vertical axis. And this uh, will become important later in the talk. So we have interesting uh, questions. Uh, you know, what is a functional form? Yeah, is it a monomer or dimer that is required to unwind the DNA? And uh, when you have two forms of the helicase, closed and open, which one is active for DNA unwinding? And also, how is unwinding regulated? So uh, there's uh, one model that uh, you know, yeah, Tim Norman and I, I propose based on, mostly based on his data, but also based on some, some of our data I'll, I'll share with you uh, shortly that uh, UVLD helicase functions in this manner. As a monomer, it can move on the DNA three to five prime directionally, but it cannot unwind the DNA, at least in a detectable manner, uh, as, uh, as a monomer. But uh, when another one comes by, uh, then uh, magic happens, and you can see unwinding. And the other model uh, is you know, the idea that you, you need just one monomer to unwind the DNA processively, and this process can continue you know, on and on. So my uh, student, uh, Kyung Suk Lee, built uh, a setup combining optical trap, optical tweezers with TURP for total internal reflection fluorescence microscopy. So the idea is that you tether one end of the long single cell DNA on a surface, five prime end, and then uh, you stretch the DNA using uh, an optical trap, and when the protein lands on it, moves uh, from three prime to five prime direction, then you will see uh, fluorescent signal uh, moving in the laboratory frame in, in your video microscopy. And this is how we prepare the DNA. So we start with uh, double strand DNA tethered to a surface. We use an exonuclease to digest one strand, sometimes all the way down, sometimes we, you know, not, not quite. So you can have some remaining double strand DNA portion. And then uh, we can use the optical trap to hold uh, one end, three prime end, and then stretch the DNA vertically in this direction, and then, uh, then start the experiment. So that's the bead, and this is the surface attachment point, and I will show you a movie. And this is a fluorescent junk, so you should ignore. Oh. Okay. Technical difficulty. Sorry. So, uh, what uh, what you uh, would have seen <laughs> is actually spot appearing in, in the middle of the DNA and then going down uh, gradually, and then uh, in addition, the spot becomes uh, brighter and brighter. Okay. And um, and uh, you can actually uh, plot this in the form of. Uh, chymograph, so you can take the section of a movie, apply it as a function of time, uh, protein binds somewhere here, and then uh, it comes down toward the surface, toward the five prime end, and it gets brighter because, not because it's collecting cosmic dust, but because uh, it, it's getting closer to the surface. You know, we have this evidence field excitation or that decays exponentially uh, as a function of distance from the surface. In fact, you can use this uh, measurement to, to de determine the depth of the uh, laser penetration into the solution. And, uh, and you can then uh, uh, determine uh, the speed and so on very accurately. So we, uh, on some DNA molecules, uh, we, are, we are lucky. You can see many, many EVRD helicases binding and translocating to the surface, uh, one after the other. And I call this my meteor shower because it's so beautiful. Uh, and you can uh, measure the slope, and then uh, the speed that we get is, uh, is almost identical to what Tim, Tim Norman measured using his uh, bulk phase assays. In some uh, cases, uh, we see that uh, EVLD comes down and then actually stops here. Uh, there's another one coming down, 
but this one is another coming down starting at the same location here. And this is not because the enzyme hit the surface, because you are still uh, quite a bit far away from the tethering point right here. So the idea we have here is that a monomer comes down and then it encounters a duplex DNA because of uh, incomplete digestion and just get a stall uh, right there. One uh, support uh, we have for this model is shown here. What you can do is to perform mechanical measurements of DNA stretching to estimate how long the double strand DNA uh, is remaining here. And then we can also measure uh, that distance uh, of the stall position to the tethering point. And you can uh, plot them one uh, after, uh, relative to the other, and we get a straight line with a slope of one, uh, supporting our idea that the enzyme as a monomer stores where it encounters a double strand DNA because it cannot unwind the DNA uh, beyond uh, the junction. A uh, more direct uh, way of looking at this is the following. We can put uh, uh, DNA oligo uh, in a defined location using a particular sequence, and you put two dyes there just to make it a bit brighter. And then uh, here is the DNA uh, uh, location where duplex DNA exists. And then UVLD binds here and then comes down, and it stores in the same exact location. And uh, there's another example here. This is where we mark the DNA for the duplex junction. If it comes down, it stores at the same location. In fact, if you measure the dis uh, separation between this and that, uh, it's, uh, it's essentially zero with plus minus 20 nanometers close to our precision of the measurement. So supporting the idea that when UVLD encounters a, a double strand DNA, it stops there. It doesn't unwind uh, beyond the junction. Uh, uh, at, at least within a resolution of about 20 base pairs. Uh, if you do experiments in higher protein concentration, you do see unwinding. You know, here's an example. So UVLD comes down and stores at the duplex junction. And then later on, then uh, it starts to move again. But uh, when it starts to move here, uh, fluorescence suddenly becomes uh, brighter. Okay. So saying that there's another protein that just came to the spot uh, at the same moment. And uh, so the idea we have is that it's coming down at this rate, and then uh, uh, it stops here, and then uh, another one comes. And then as uh, two proteins, then it can unwind the DNA, but at a slow rate. It's known from Tim's measurement that unwinding is about three or four times slower than translocation. Uh, in addition, you can. Uh, measure the force uh, on the bead, and then show that at the very moment that uh, force uh, starts to decrease now, because now it's generating uh, additional single strand DNA. So, so the, the kind of data we have here, and then other kinds of data suggest that uh, EVLD as a monomer is not able to unwind DNA, uh, at least not very well. You need to have one, more than one protein to achieve so. The second uh, uh, interesting question was uh, the, the following. You know, why do you have two different conformations, uh, open and closed, for PCR and UVLD rapid helicases? In, uh, in the open conformation, this was called to be domain, is swung open. And in the closed conformation, it swivels around the vertical axis uh, by 130 degrees uh, to obtain this conformation. And it's, it's a really large movement. Some pairs of residues on the protein can change the distance by more than 50 angstroms. Okay. And uh, because this was uh, crystallized uh, with uh, duplex with a three prime tail, a natural substrate for the enzyme, uh, it was natural to propose that this closed form is a functional form for DNA unwinding. Just want to uh, uh, show you you know, all of the structure that have been solved over the years, the PCRA was the first ever helicase uh, whose structure was determined, uh, apple form in the open form, and RAP was uh, solved in, uh, by Tim Norman and, and Waxman, bound to single and DNA, both uh, open and closed, and PCRA bound to partial duplex and in the closed, where young structure uh, also, you know, uh, UVLD uh, closed, and UVLD as, by, as an apple is, is open. So basically, all three helicases have two different forms, nearly identical. And because of the, uh, this, these structures, 
you know, it was believed that the closed form was the active form for unwinding, which is, I think, very reasonable. But, um, but uh, we have some different ideas. Uh, for example, when uh, Tim Lohmann's lab uh, deleted the 2B domain, then uh, the protein still functioned. So that was in contrast to the proposal here where this 2B domain in contact with the duplex is essential for unwinding the DNA actively. And in addition, uh, Tim's group showed that uh, this uh, uh, mutant without the 2B domain unwinds DNA as a monomer. Not very well, but still pretty good. Uh, you, know, you can unwind 30 base for DNA as a monomer. Uh, and uh, third, um, we have some single molecule data where, where the rap helicase can move on the three prime tail, but it encounters a duplex and snaps back to the beginning and repeat the process many, many times. But uh, if, you, uh, if you label the protein in such a way that uh, high FREP between the two dyes reports on protein uh, domain closing, what we see as a function of time is that as a protein approaches the duplex, FRET goes up gradually, meaning that uh, the 2B domain closes gradually, and eventually then it goes back. So we thought that maybe closing of the 2B domain is a signal that it has reached the junction that it needs to go back as a regulatory mechanism. So this is a cartoon that we made. Uh, it's a DNA with a three, three prime tail and butterflies appro approaching the junction. As it approaches the junction, it slows down the flapping and then it stops uh, at, at a at the closed form and it stops there and then it goes back. So that was the idea. And so that's why we thought uh, closed form is inactive for unwinding. So, um, so that was uh, the, our, our proposal. So five years ago, I met uh, Mark Dillingham, uh, who is a structural biologist in UK at a meeting and we had a small argument that I told him, well, I think it's the open form that is active for unwinding. And uh, Mark told me that, well, uh, TJ, I like you. I like your work, but I think you're wrong here. Uh, so he said it must be the closed form. So if I thought, well, you know, we probably need, need uh, have to have actual data right, to address this point. So uh, I emailed my student, Sinan, well, you know, why don't you uh, cross-link two, two systems on the helicase so that you can uh, stabilize a closed conformation and show that that uh, form is inactive and, and then sh prove him wrong. You cannot prove me right, but you can prove him wrong. Okay? So, uh, so that's what he did. So he uh, put two cysteines um, uh, here on 2B and 1B domains shown in the red residues. So that in the closed form, they are seven angstroms apart. So you can cross-link them using uh, by functional uh, cross-linkers. But in the open form, they are 42 angstroms apart, so you cannot cross-link. So basically, if you do it this way, then you cannot uh, take the open form. So, uh, so we called uh, this uh, version rep x uh, for x for cross-linking. Then we made a control construct where we uh, put the cysteines in this manner so that they are next to each other in the open form, but 28 angstroms apart in the closed form. So that should stabilize the protein in the open form. We call this rep, oh, I miss, miss, misspoke. I, we said rep Y, sorry about that. Um, so the question was, which one is active for unwinding? And uh, I think I'm gonna skip this slide, but, uh, but I was really impressed because my physics student was able to come up with essays to to show that uh, cross-linking is actually uh, uh, intramolecular, but not uh, intermolecular. And, uh, and then uh, he did uh, uh, ATPase assays, and it, it turned out that uh, ATPase uh, rate didn't really change upon cross-linking. So I was very disappointed. But I told him, May maybe you need to give the enzyme more difficult task of unwinding the DNA, and then you'll see a difference. So the assay here is a FRET-based assay, uh, ensemble FRET. You have a labeled DNA, initially high FRET, but if the enzyme unwinds the DNA, you get a reduction in FRET. So in ensemble FRET measurement, as a function of time, 
Red uh, wire type unwinds DNA very slowly, even at high concentrations. But red X unwound DNA much faster. So I was actually surprised because actually I had already bet some money with, uh, against Mark, right? 50 cents. And but, uh, but I knew that my student was not fabricating the data because he was showing me directly opposite to what I was expecting to see. I was, right? So, and then he did some more controls. So if you uh, uh, have two systems but do not use cross-linking, then uh, you don't get this uh, fast unwinding of rep X. And if you do the same with uh, rep Y cross-linked into the open form, that is the same as the Y type, rep X is much faster. So it's not just cross-linking or topological enclosure of the DNA that causes fast unwinding, but really the closed form stabilization. So the next question is that why? Uh, is it because you form dimers better with cross-linking? Or maybe you have now a monomolecular helicase that is very active. So with this single molecule fried experiment, we immobilize uh, the enzyme using a histidine tag and an antibody on a surface. And then we added a DNA shown here, uh, labeled in such a way that you begin with relatively a uh, low or medium fret. And, and so you get uh, similar intensities in green and red. And when the uh, protein binds, uh, the, uh, DNA binds to the protein, uh, on the spot you see a sudden increase in fluorescence and nothing happens until DNA dissociates, and then another DNA bind, dissociate, and so on. Especially when you have red helicase bound to the D, uh, surface, and it captures the DNA, it doesn't unwind. It just, you know, holds on to for a while and then release, uh, it releases the DNA. But, uh, and same for rep Y, but if you uh, do rep X, you see something different. So you see initial binding, and then, uh, uh, fret actually increases, and then uh, fret drop to uh, zero, and then you lose uh, the total fluorescent signal, and you see three events that happen in succession on the same uh, helicase molecule. So what's going on here is that when helicase unwinds the DNA, then unwind uh, strand becomes coiled up, bringing uh, the, that dye closer to the green on average, and then uh, that gives you an increase in fret. When you unwind uh, the DNA fully, then red strand uh, is gone. So we, you get zero thread here. And then uh, finally, when you release the green strand, then you uh, go back to the basal level of fluorescence. And you can repeat this many times. It turns out that 80% uh, of the binding events actually uh, result in full unwinding, sh showing that rep X monomer is now active as a monomer, and it can unwind you know, these duplexes are uh, quite well with high, uh, high yield. So then uh, we uh, decided to test how, how good a helicase this is by using optical tweezers uh, experiments. So we uh, worked with a student in Jan Schemler's group uh, in Urbana. So there uh, we have two uh, dual -tree optical tweezers and there's a bead uh, with a DNA, a six kilo base pair long DNA with a three prime tail of various lengths. And then second bead is coated with uh, antibodies against the uh, histidine tag, so you can grab uh, rep X on the bead surface. And then, uh, then once you form a link between the two beads, and if you have ATP, then uh, helicase will unwind the DNA, and then the DNA between the two will become shorter and shorter. So distance between the two beads will decrease as a function of time. So this is the actual experiment. You can, uh, in the microfluidic chamber, you have a, a capture channel uh, with, with ATP gamma S to uh, uh, establish a link, and then you move the uh, tethered uh, DNA to the ATP chamber, and, and then when, when you move into the ATP chamber uh, shown by this boundary, then the length of the DNA starts to decrease. Okay. And monotonically, with some pauses, and basically, uh, what we find is that every binding event that you see results in full unwinding of uh, uh, this long DNA. I mean, at, at the bottom, we have to stop the reaction because two bits uh, collide with each other where you cannot do measurements anymore. 
but you know, we believe that if uh, DNA is much longer, then it will probably have no problem in unwinding even longer DNA. So it's highly processive, limited likely by the length of the DNA. And this is true for uh, different tail lengths and also different folds and with and without SSB. So that was really impressive because, uh, you know, uh, you know, because it can you know, unwind DNA as a monomer uh, for uh, such a long distance. And this is uh, comparing uh, rep X with rep Y and rep, you know, fraction of uh, uh, unwinding events. You know, if you establish a tether, only rep X show this you know, you know, incredible uh, ability to unwind DNA over long distances. You can also uh, perform the measurement where you don't have the force uh, feedback, so that force is free to increase, and then you can see that uh, enzyme can unwind 30, 40 fig picconutions of uh, opposing force before tether breaks. And uh, you can also measure the average velocity, uh, uh, the normalized velocity as a function of force. It doesn't decrease uh, with increasing force up to the moment that DNA undergoes uh, its own transition. So we now call this RepX a superhelic case because it's, it's super, at least to our mind. So uh, the conclusion here is that I think I lost my bet with Mark. And so the lesson here is a never bet against a structural biologist. Now, uh, if the closed form is uh, uh, active in unwinding, then why did nature create uh, the open form? This question can be looked at using what's called the uh, hairpin essay. So we, uh, we have uh, hairpin in the middle of a DNA and uh, in a double trap uh, configuration. And the protein comes and uh, unwinds the DNA. Then uh, as you unwind uh, the, uh, the DNA hairpin, the distance between the two bits uh, will increase as a function of time. And then you can read uh, using the, the optical trap. But because now we have uh, this uh, instrument that can also measure fluorescence in the middle of the DNA, you can then use that instrument to measure uh, copy on the, um, of the protein monomer dimer or protein conformations. So this is the, uh, the experiment uh, where we are measuring uh, number base pairs unwound as a function of time for the hairpin. And you can see that uh, DNA is be getting unwound by a single UVRD enzyme labeled with uh, two dyes so that uh, high FRET corresponds to the closed form and low FRET uh, open form. And you can see DNA unwinds, uh, at least under tension, it can unwind uh, DNA as a monomer to a limited degree. And then it can, uh, but instead of continuing further, it comes back down and uh, unwinds and resips, unwind, resips, and it repeats it many, many times. Basically sitting there idling, you know, without uh, really uh, going very far, eventually it dissociates. If you measure a thread from the same molecule simultaneously, these are the raw data of green and red intensities. Uh, and this is a FRET efficiency that you calculate. And we can begin to assign uh, different FRET stage, you know, low FRET stage uh, for the open form and high FRET state uh, for the closed form. And, and then, uh, then we can actually uh, color different segments of the trajectories when FRET is high, uh, you color this segment uh, in red and for all of the high FRET uh, segments, and likewise for the low FRET segments. Then if you look at the uh, optical trap trajectory, when FRET is high, uh, DNA is being, being unwound. When uh, you can see them here, 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 and here, and here, and then when uh, FRET is low, uh, generally DNA is getting uh, resipped. So the situa situation is actually uh, more nuanced that you, know, you have the closed form, high flat form is used to unwind the DNA, but then after unwinding some number of base pairs, then uh, enzyme somehow switches back and then uh, causes the zipping of the DNA, but in that process, uh, it takes the open form. You can do this from many, many molecules and plot a two-dimensional histogram, FRET versus velocity, 
So when fat is high, velocity is positive, you are unwinding the DNA, and fat is low, it's negative, you are rezipping the DNA. Okay? So closed form for unwinding, uh, open form for uh, rezipping. So we have this uh, model uh, uh, called a strand reversal model where uh, helicase is moving three prime to five prime direction to unwind the duplex DNA. But after unwinding uh, some number of base pairs, it undergoes some kind of transition to a uh, strand uh, switch to the five prime strand. And then it uh, translocates on the three prime to five prime direction on this strand. And then it causes the zipping of the DNA upon its awake. And then it switch back and then uh, repeat the process many, many times. So that's the idea behind this model. And the idea is that uh, when it's unwinding, it takes the closed form, contacting the duplex DNA with the 2B domain. And then when it needs to switch to reverse the direction, it maintains the contact with the duplex using the 2B domain, but uh, it undergoes a conformation change uh, into the open form so that now you can engage uh, the other uh, DNA tail and translocate on that tail and causing DNA rezipping. So that is the strand uh, reversal or strand switching model that uh, uh, we propose. So the idea that we have right now is that in vivo, strand switching and rezipping uh, after unwinding, just a few base pairs can keep the enzyme in the off state because you want to regulate the function. Again, you don't want these enzymes to burst, go berserk and unwind every DNA that they see. Right? So you want to keep them in the off state, but in the right place. So it basically it's idling there, unwind a little bit and come back and, and so on, comes back. And, and then likely in, in vivo, uh, a partner protein can come in to stabilize the closed form and the switching it on and making it a really super active helicase. In RepX, we actually, uh, uh, make it a super the case by uh, disallowing the open form required for strand switching. So you cannot strand switch anymore. Now it has to keep going in the same direction. We also did the same experiment with the PCRA. Uh, and uh, likewise, uh, FRED and then optical trap measurement showed that PCRA X in the closed form becomes a super the case. And for PCRA, we have a known protein uh, that is uh, known to activate this helicase function. So what we did was we uh, purified this uh, protein called RAPD uh, and then uh, uh, measured the PCRA protein's conformation using a single molecule FRED. And without uh, this activating protein, we see single molecule FRED histogram shown here in black, mainly uh, open form. But if you add a uh, RAPD protein uh, that is known to activate the helicase activity, then you stabilize selectively the high fat colorless conformation. So this suggests that uh, perhaps RAPD makes the PCRA enzyme a uh, really good helicase by stabilizing the closed conformation and by preventing strand uh, switching reaction. So uh, we have uh, a monomotic superhelicase. That's nice because you don't have to assemble uh, multimeric enzymes. And uh, there's no nuclease activities unlike in Rec Big CD. So we can envision uh, several uh, useful directions in biotechnological applications. One idea is to use this uh, for single molecule DNA sequencing in nanopores. Why? Because uh, nanopores can read the DNA sequence uh, by changing its current through a pore. Uh, the helicase can provide uh, DNA one base at a time at a measured pace. And because our helicase is very processive and robust against force, you can uh, read uh, thousands of base pairs uh, in, one, uh, in one DNA. Second application is called isothermal DNA amplification. In PCR, you have to uh, go up and down in temperature because you have to melt a double strand DNA you just made. But uh, if you have an enzyme that can unwind the DNA, do the melting for you, then you don't have to do that. You can do everything in one temperature. And that can be useful if you want to have assays for detecting pathogenic DNA in Africa, or if you want to have a quick uh, test for DNA content uh, 
in uh, in few situations where you don't need you don't want to wait for uh, an hour before PCR is complete. So here's an example. We are working with uh, Jens Gundlach in University of Washington. Uh, his uh, single molecule sequencing platform, and so we are using our uh, our superhelicases to feed the DNA into the nanopore and then read the current as a function of time. You see many different levels for different sequences, and you can uh, call different levels. And then uh, and th there's an algorithm to uh, align uh, the uh, s current data to the known sequence of this phase of DNA. Then we can actually see uh, uh, pretty good correspondence between our measured uh, current levels in red and then predicted uh, current levels. So you know, it's, it's early, but it shows that our superhelicase can be used for you know, getting s information from uh, DNA at the single molecule level over you know, many, many thousands of base pairs. Here's another an example of doing uh, isothermal DNA amplification. So we uh, add this PCRAX, which is actually from a thermophilic uh, organism. So it functions at uh, high temperatures. And then you add uh, <coughs> DNA polymerase and primers and so on with a 1K, ba ba uh, 1K or 5 kilobase DNA template. And we can am amplify 1 kilobase DNA, 5 kilobase DNA uh, at a constant temperature. Right? There's no thermocycling. And if you use a uh, wild type, then you get a smear here. So it's, uh, it's actually beginning to work. Uh, you can amplify DNA you know, even very long DNA, and I think there are uh, s several interesting uh, uh, applications here. Let me stop. Uh, Sinan Arslan was my uh, main hero for the superhelicase story. We have a uh, really uh, long-standing collaboration with Jan Schoenland's lab. Matt Comstock is the one who built this uh, uh, fancy instrument uh, and uh, measured EBRD confirmation changes uh, during unwinding. Uh, we've been working with Tim Norman's lab for many, many years, and Chris Thomas was a collaborator on the RAPD uh, protein. Thank you very much. Yeah, so uh, on the way back, the speed also depends on the ATP concentration. So it's powered by ATP, not just slipping. So what do you think about the generality of the mechanism beyond superfamily one helicases? Um, do you think the same sort of mechanism is going to be in play for SF2s? I know we've seen you know, RepQ can sort of go back and forth like that as well. Um, do you think this is a general theme of all um, non-hexamerical things? So uh, that, that's a very good question. You, you so, uh, published a really beautiful structure uh, uh, this year with the uh, same, uh, same group on RACU helicase in the closed form. And there is a, a very a striking uh, change between closed and open forms. Right? So, so, so I think it, it'll be really interesting to also cross-link the protein into closed form and see if it becomes a super helicase. Right? And my prediction is that uh, it can be done, but it'll take a lot of effort because you have to use a different approach. RedCube has a lot of systems, like 30 systems, so you need probably five registering times to, <laughs> we have to use uh, other, other approaches. Yeah. But I think the me mechanism like this would be probably, I, would, I wouldn't call it general, but it'll be uh, found to apply in uh, other classes. Not all, but. When you're actually talking about the pair of the red unwinding DNA versus the red Y and red S, I was thinking that the red should be a super portion of the red Y and red X activity. So does it mean that the most of the confirmation in the red is actually a uh, super OK, so that uh, is is so I, th I think the is, is it, okay so that is, it's a complicated uh, uh, question to answer um, so rep y is in the open form but if you have high high enough concentration rep y does unwind dna not not very well but 
So th this means that closed form per se is not essential, you know, essential for uh, unwinding, but it's more that uh, open form is needed for strand switching. Okay. And we don't see any difference between wrap Y and wrap in terms of you know long distance unwinding. Yes. It's really intriguing as a balloon, as a really case approaches the surface. Yeah. It took its time, first it slows down. It hasn't quite reached the deep as much as it knows it slows down. And then it says that it's a period of the second antenna to get in there mm. and bump the um, second, first one off. Yet you don't see the kind of convert if you put the second antenna to get in So, uh, yeah, yeah. So, okay, the first question was uh, actually, it doesn't slow down. Uh, we may be uh, referring to uh, stall stalls that we see at defined locations. So when the enzyme keeps moving, there's no slowing down. Uh, so it, it continues to move in the same with the same speed. Now uh, uh, you you had uh, you had a sharp you had sharp eyes to notice that when you had uh, two proteins appearing uh, to unwind the DNA, uh, there was no prior history of uh, following the strand DNA by the second protein. It just seems to appear on the same spot. And so we have, uh, we have really a limited number of uh, molecules that we, we, I think we have maybe less than 10 events like this because if you go to higher concentration to increase these events frequency, then, uh, then uh, background uh, that becomes an issue. So we don't have a lot of data, but we do have some examples where we see uh, another protein following from, from, from the, uh, it, uh, approaching it uh, by translocation. So we see both, both types of events. Yeah, no more questions. 